This is World to Win, bringing you the latest news and analysis from a socialist perspective. Welcome back everyone to World to Win. We have an exciting episode this week. We're gonna take a little bit of a different approach. We're gonna look at something a bit more historical. Today marks the anniversary of the murder of Martin Luther King. So we have two guests on that are gonna talk about his legacy, but also a name that you may not have heard before, Ida B. Wells. Before we get into our episode though, I wanna say hello to my co-host Yara. How's it going today, Yara? I'm good, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm really excited for this episode. We've been talking about, you know, all these current events, but it's so important that we take a step back and look at our our, our rich working class history. A hundred percent, and especially when this is still current events. <laughs> it's not like racism has disappeared. It's not like we're not fighting for civil rights anymore. And I think learning from the lessons that we've had in the past is more relevant than ever right now. I totally agree. I mean, we're we're in a, a a crazy time right now, coming off of the you know George Floyd rebellion um, that we saw over the past year, but also you know imperialism around the world, the wars that we see in Africa and the Middle East, the crazy police repression that we see in Myanmar and China, and all of these things were um, also happening at a time when Martin Luther King was organizing. So let me introduce our first guest. We have Algier. Um, who has been on our show before. I'm sure all of you um, have seen him. And if you haven't, check out our, our episodes in the past where we've had Algier on. How's it going, Algier? Pretty good. How are you guys doing? I'm doing great. Good to see you again. I'm so glad you're here. And then we have a new guest on with us today, Quinn, who's from my city, Boston. She's a BU student. How are you today, Quinn? Good. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. So we're going to get started, like I said, talking about the radical legacy of Martin Luther King. Um, you know, in the U.S., he's uh, have he you know he's been raised up real high as kind of the the beacon of the civil rights movement. But of course, um, you know the the mainstream media uh, doesn't talk about the 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 true radical nature of of. Um, you know, his, his politics and, and what he put forward in the civil rights movement. So I want to start with you, Algier. Um, you know, Dr. Martin Luther King had so many contributions to uh, not just the civil rights movement, but to the labor movement as, as well. But before, you know, uh, before we get into all of the history, what do you think are some of his greatest contributions? Well, I think when we speak of the radical Dr. King, um, we're looking at an individual, certainly, who could have lived a life of great privilege uh, as a Baptist minister uh, in, in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, he could have been living a very comfortable life. But in fact, uh, his, his political work was rooted in a radical liberation theology. It was rooted in understanding of international uh, developments. It was rooted, really, uh, in, in the ability in, in, in the prospect of working people, the poor and the oppressed, specifically that of the black working class and poor uh, to be the agents of revolutionary change, of radical change in the society. And so his greatest contribution, and when we look at the long arc of, of his work, his political work for 13 years before his assassination, um, it's really rooted in the fact that uh, the only force in society that can change the world is the working class. It's, it's rooted, it's unity, uh, it's, uh, it's perspective of its place in the world. And so the radical Dr. King, in some ways, we have to resuscitate, revitalize, to really learn a lesson from him. Yeah, I think, I think it's really interesting to hear about him because he is such a well-known character. And I think, especially now, you know, there's all of these kind of people talking about him as a very kind of, vanilla character of just someone who everyone agrees with uh you know everyone hates racism and i think it was he even though he's like remembered like that and is remembered as one of if not the most influential and remembered like leader of a mass struggle of resistance but at the same time people look at the democrats as heroes at the time, as people who worked with him. And, you know, JFK and even Lyndon B. John Johnson were praised, uh, are praised right now for what they did for the policies against racism and all of that. 
um, and also for equality and for black and poor people. So I want to ask you, is that kind of, is that the correct approach, do you think? Um, how, how were the Democrats different from organizations like the NAA, uh, the NAACP? And also, what what is actually the role that Democrats played? Well, I, I think it's important uh, because if we're going to give an understanding of what the civil rights movement was and what it accomplished, it must be looked at with the lens of the post-World War II era, uh, where U.S. capitalism really became a superpower. And at the same time, around the world, it was the anti-colonial struggles, uh, the existence of the Soviet Union as a polar uh, opposite uh, to the uh, to you to U.S. and Western imperialism and capitalism, despite the deformities of what existed in the Soviet Union under the Stalinist, the, the various Stalinist regimes, um, and so uh, it was a world of great turmoil, of social struggle, of revolution, but of also counter revolution. And so the civil rights movement really put to the fore this question of how could you speak as an American, as American society, as an American democracy and capitalism speak of the virtues of your society when the large portion of your society can't vote, it's being attacked by dogs, it doesn't have access to public facilities, uh, it is dealing with racial oppression, dealing with law enforcement terror. And so in many ways, the Democratic Party had to answer to that now living reality. Beginning in 1940, a majority of black people were voting for the Democratic Party. They were moving their uh, elite from the Republican Party, in fact, the party of Lincoln, uh, the party that freed the slaves, uh, the party that uh, uh, ushered the radical reconstruction period of, of, 1860, of 1868 to 1877. And so the allegiance started to change to FDR uh, uh, during the New Deal and thereafter. And so when we understand the Democratic Party, the ruling elite of the United States really had no choice but to usher democratic reforms when it came to the questions of racism and to the question of racial oppression. Um, and those were significant. They were absolutely vital. But let's be clear, it is not due to the benevolence of Lyndon B. Johnson or JFK. In fact, they sowed the seeds to what we understand of mass incarceration today. They sowed the seeds of, of the various elements uh, that we're dealing with uh, at this juncture uh, of, of time. So the civil rights movement was part of a global revolt against capitalism, against colonialism, uh, and against imperialism. So Quinn, I want to talk to you now. You know, Martin Luther King, a lot of people don't know um, you know, how involved with the labor movement he actually was. And so I, I want to ask you about this one quote. He was speaking in front of t um, some Teamsters. And I'm going to, I, I want to read it perfectly so I, I don't misquote him. He said, Negroes are not only the poor in, not the only poor in the nation. There are nearly twice as many white poor as Negro. And therefore the struggle against poverty is not involved solely with color or racial discrimination, but with elementary economic justice. And I mean, this quote is so powerful um, and it shows the problem, you know, as MLK saw it was not just a problem of racial equality, but it was economic equality as well. Um, and I mean, if we're honest, saying this quote today might even be looked at as as controversial, um, you know, especially with the heavy, you know, uh, identity politics that we see in the movement today. Um, and, you know, the lack of, of solidarity um, between, uh, you know, black workers and white workers that's kind of pushed onto onto people. So I'm. You know, what, Quinn, is uh, your take on what Martin Luther King um, meant by this quote? And is there a place for white people in the struggle for Black liberation? Yeah, um, great question. I think Martin Luther King was just one of so many Black freedom leaders at the time who were really starting to put together that, like, you know, racism hadn't fallen out of the sky. Um, it arose as an ideology to justify specific um, economic aims. Of course, you know, that first being the, the slave trade um, and then at evolving over time um, to suit the needs of mass incarceration, which we know is also hugely profitable. 
Um, and so what it basically served to do was develop a, a superiority complex in white workers where they're unable to recognize their shared interests with black workers, um, where, where a section of the white working class uh, remains convinced that they have more in common with their white boss than with their black coworker. Um, so capitalism really thrived on this. Um, and I think, yeah, it's no coincidence that MLK was giving this quote at a, a union meeting. I think um, labor is one of the major ways where we can rebuild that solidarity between black and white workers. Um, and you're absolutely right to say that, yeah, like things are much different today. I think um, compared to MLK's day, the labor movement um, and the left more broadly is really beaten back and um, far from power compared to then. And so these, these ideas aren't as prevalent um, and yeah, can even be controversial, like you said. Um, but I'm hoping that um, with time and through struggle, it will become clear to people that all workers, uh, including white workers, are indispensable, actually, in the fight for black liberation um, because it's tied to um, a, f a broader fight against capitalism, um, which all workers benefit from. And I think that becomes clear when we have um, a program of black liberation that's not so individualized and is instead about like systemic change. Um, you know, things like raising the minimum wage, um, which would uh, vastly disproportionately benefit um, black workers or even things like defunding the police. You know, obviously that's critical for the, the everyday safety of black people, um, but also anyone who suffered a, a mental, public mental health crisis, um, trans people, people who've had um, police interrogating their picket line, um, people who've had police, you know, participating in their eviction process, all workers um, benefit from the defunding of the police. So I think... Um, yeah, when we have that systemic program, uh, that's another way that the solidarity can be rebuilt. Yeah, I completely agree. I think it's, it's kind of like the best way for the capitalist class, the ruling class, to break down these movements against oppression when they use the same tactics that they use while oppressing us to kind of move us away from fighting against this oppression by separating us, by playing this kind of divide and rule tactic. And I think it's so crucial that we all work together and make those connections between the, the, the position in society of poor working class people, of all ethnicities, of like anywhere around the world and kind of point the blame at the real people who are to blame, who are the capitalists, who are the ruling class, who are the rich. And I think it's it's really, really important because I also think that it, it's, it's completely reasonable that people who are experiencing this oppression would make these connections at the end of the day because it's not just, like, the, you can see it, it's not just minorities who are being oppressed. Uh, it's not just women. It's everyone who is a worker who is being oppressed. So making these connections and fighting alongside each other because we're not fighting for some against someone else's oppression. We're fighting against the biggest oppression of all, which is causing all of that oppression. And I think Martin Luther King was one of the people who really n noticed this and really could like point the finger at it. And you know, before we had the George Floyd rebellion last year, this wasn't the only mass struggle in the history of the U.S. You know. Uh, the resistance against the Vietnam War, for example, was one of the largest protest movements in US history. And, you know, at, at that time, US imperialism was really once again inserting itself internationally and kind of trying to fight in other places. And we discussed last week about the situation right now, um, uh, about US-China relations. We, we've discussed how imperialist battles like that between all of these capitalists have this horrible effect on the working class of both of, of both of these nations, but also internationally when we're talking about kind of political powers of that level. So I was wondering, Algier, can you tell us a little bit about how King, uh, how how was King influenced by the Vietnam War and by the resistance against it, and also how did it help develop the Poor People's Campaign? Well, Dr. King's internationalism goes back to 1957. Uh, he uh, attended the transfer of power from the British Empire uh, to the to Kwame Nkrumah uh, uh, organization uh, in Ghana, uh, following that protracted struggle that took place. Uh, certainly, his trips to India, uh, certainly uh, his words on the question of South Africa, 
African apartheid. So King was not a stranger to the question of internationalism and the international working class struggle. Uh, what is different is because we must understand that the civil rights movement at a, cer at a certain phase was really going down the road of a more reformist, try to put more pressure on the Democratic Party uh, to usher the civil rights bill and also the voting rights bill of 64 and 65. And so uh, King started to recognize that, yes, we may get the right to vote. And yes, we may get uh, desegregated lunch counters. But in fact, can a man and a woman actually uh, buy a hamburger if they don't get paid enough? Does, how much does it matter that they can sit at an integrated lunch counter, but they can't buy a meal? And so King started to make these links at the same time as Lyndon B. Johnson, as I said previously, was sowing the seeds of mass incarceration, was also sowing the seeds. This is a time period of the Cold War. And so the escalation of the war and the U.S. involvement in the war really troubled Dr. King. He understood that, in fact, all the questions of the war and poverty was being died were being uh, uh, being died on the on the battlefields of Vietnam, and so uh, U.S. troops, particularly Black U.S. troops, were dying at the front at a tremendous rate. He also saw on the on the news itself the destruction that U.S. imperialism was uh, was was bringing down on the Vietnamese working class, the poor, and the peasantry. And so King is sitting back watching these events, mind you. The majority of the civil rights movement did not want to speak on this issue because the close relationship or the perceived close relationship they had with Linda B. Johnson, in fact. And so it took two years before King made a statement. In fact, behind the scenes, and most people don't know this, that Dr. King, in fact, tried to negotiate a peace deal between the United States, United States and, 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 and the National Liberation Front. Um, in fact, all those things failed. And King had to make a statement at some point. He broke with the traditional civil rights organizations like the NAACP. And King made that statement. What King did in my in, in the final point I want to make, King married the anti-war movement against Vietnam to the civil rights movement, to the youth movement. And ultimately, that played a very important role to what we understand as a poor people's campaign that was launched in 1967, 1968, leading up to his death. And so what King did, the radical King, which they don't talk about, is that he made the connection between the imperial war, the question of environmental destruction, the question of civil rights and human rights at home. And in fact, we needed a social movement and mass movement that talked about these things and to, and, and to develop what I would say the mosaic of what a, a, a socialist society would look like, as an example. I love these types of conversations, Algier, because we really get to talk about things that aren't taught in school or aren't talked about in the mainstream media. Um, you know, all the backstory I think is so important. And, you know, listening to you speak about, you know, the point where Martin Luther King had to take that step away. He had to make that break um, because the civil rights movement and, you know, the, the, the leaders of that time weren't taking the steps that were necessary, weren't going far enough, um, is super inspiring and shows um, shows the need to make systematic fundamental change. We can't just rely on these older institutions. Um, but, you know, when people think back, you know, to the history of the 40s, 50s, 60s of the civil rights movement, you know, they think of people like Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks. Um, they think of the Jim, the Jim Crow South and the the lynching that existed, and they think of the struggles of the, you know, the lunch counters, and you know, you mentioned that a little bit um, before. But oftentimes, people forget about the North, right? Because the northern part of the United States segregation wasn't legal, but that didn't mean that, you know, uh, illegal segregation or segregation by default didn't exist. It didn't mean that there was no racism and that the North was some sort of like safe haven for 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 black people. I mean, in my city in Boston, uh, my my uncle talks about this all the time: how he will never support the Red Sox to this day because they were the last baseball team to receive a black player. Um, and you know, in, in, in the Boston public schools didn't officially desegregate until the late seventies. Um, you know, and Ruby Bridges uh, was participating in desegregation much earlier than that in the South. And so um, there was, you know, stark differences between um, life in the, the North and the South between legal uh, segregation and, you know, segregation by default. Um, but the, in the North, you know, of the U.S., we had Malcolm X, we had the Black Panther Party. 
Um, but I, you know, I want to take a step back and, and talk a little bit about uh, how the differences between what racism and what life was like in, in the North and the South, what effect did that have on the consciousness um, and the politics of Martin Luther King? So I, I thought that the New York Yankees had the distinction of being the last major league baseball team to, to integrate, in fact. I don't know. I'll have to check with my uncle. Maybe he's been hating these Red Sox for so long for no reason. I thought Boston held the legacy, but I'll default to you. New York can take that. Okay. Okay. Well, it, it probably was the New York Yankees because they, they're such an insidious organization. Uh, it's so corporate. But nonetheless, um, in the sense of Dr. King, and this is a very important history uh, that does need to be looked at, that the Southern apartheid, uh, Jim and Jane Crow that we understand, uh, was without question one of the most heinous crimes against humanity, uh, certainly following chattel slavery and what we've seen all around the world globally throughout the history of world history, human history. But what took place in the North was also very uh, clandestine and different. Uh, the working class, the black working class had to deal with police violence, had to deal with segregated schools as well, uh, had to deal with uh, uh, redlining, segregation in housing and, and access. And this was, just wasn't in, in the northern uh, eastern part of the country. It was in the Midwest. It was in the West Coast, states like California, certainly in, in Chicago, Illinois, New York City, Boston, Massachusetts. And so when King um, was on vacation, the Watts riots or the Watts rebellion, to be more politically accurate, um, took place. Dr. King was asked to come to Watts uh, in 19, uh, 1965. And when he got there, Dr. King was cursed at. Dr. King was ceremoniously told, get the hell out of here. We don't need you here. And, and, and I think King did not understand fully that the civil rights movement in the South did not translate fully to the northern cosmopolitan urban centers of the United States, where it had a different culture, it had a different rhythm, it had a different type of leadership. Yes, you're absolutely correct. The influence of Malcolm X, the influence of the Black liberation uh, struggle, Black nationalism, the question of, of, of Pan-African ideas really was a, a true reality in the urban center, uh, urban centers. Also, a powerful trade union movement as well. Uh, and so when Dr. King decided to go to Chicago in 1966, this was very important to lead a campaign in Chicago that allowed him to understand the rhythm of the struggle in the Northern cities. And he understood now that the gains of the, of, of the Southern civil rights movement did not translate fully to the northern uh, areas of the country. And so that's a very important development, which also leads and ties into the Poor People's Campaign uh, and also the Memphis Sanitation Workers' Strike. These are things that are very, very instructive for his own political maturation, and his own political development, and ultimately his own organizational devo development of the uh, Southern Christian Legion Conference. Yeah, I think this is so interesting. And obviously, as someone who is not American, I have never kind of heard about the situation in the north but i think it makes so much sense because you know even today maybe there's no kind of active segregation but racism is still a big thing and it's not going away because of the system and because of how much it profits from it um but i think w when we're talking about things that maybe we like not everyone knows as much about as they should we we hear about martin luther king all the time uh, that and, and there, there's Obviously, there's so much that he did, and he's such an interesting character as well. And there's so many lessons that can be learned from his uh, actions uh, that is completely understandable why he's so famous. But there are also so many other big, influential characters in this fight against oppression that are not that kind of wildly known. Um, but that obviously also played important roles in the struggle. So if we go back a few years or decades uh, before Martin Luther King. There's Ida B. Wales, who is definitely one of those influential people. She's did so much, it's kind of incredible that we don't know more about her. And just last week, uh, her 90th, the 90th of her anniversary of her death was marked. So, Quinn, can you tell us a little bit about um, 
about who Ida, well Ida B. Wells was. I know you wrote a really interesting article. Basically everything that I know about her is from your article. So I want to hear more about uh, who she was and why she's so important to know about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was so much fun learning about her. She's incredible. Um, she was born in, uh, into slavery in the 1860s. Um, so she was part of a generation that was getting to see um, a lot of fight back among the enslaved. Um, and her, She and her family got to experience emancipation. Um, and so she was really coming of age in the post-Reconstruction era. So this was a time when you had all these newly freed black people in the South and basically no federal effort to ensure their civil rights or their safety. Um, and I also think it's worth noting that this was during industrialization and sort of the Gilded Age where there's this emerging ultra rich class and, um, you know, dramatically widening wealth inequality. And so with that uh, widening wealth inequality, you also get this renewed effort to divide workers, um, even nastier forms of racism sort of cropping up and being planted into the South. Um, so it was just this sort of cocktail of political and economic conditions um, that unfortunately led to widespread lynching in the South. Um, and Wells was one of many people who was affected. She had three close friends who were lynched. Um, they had opened up a, a shop um, next to a white-owned um, grocery store. Um, they were accused of wounding the white shop owner. Um, a mob uh, dragged the three men out of jail before they'd even stood trial for this alleged uh, crime and, and killed her three friends. So that was really radicalizing for her. Um, and it spurred on this incredible um, investigative journalism effort that um, is just historic. Uh, she personally investigated hundreds and hundreds of lynchings um, and gathered data um, and published it. She had her own publication the uh, I think it was called the Free Press. Um, and with this journalism, what she was doing was forcing the public to basically reckon with the scale of lynching, uh, reckon with the complicity of the police, uh, reckon with the fact that these uh, black people getting lynched had done nothing wrong. Um, so that, I think, was just uh, her most sort of subst uh, substantial contribution to the, the civil rights movement, um, really indispensable research. Um, but far from her only contribution, she was also really active in the NAACP. She was one of the founding members in 1909. Uh, She's known for being sort of on the radical wing politically of the leadership. Um, she was also active in the Black Women's Club movement and the suffrage movement. Uh, she really had a hand just about everywhere in uh, the civil rights movement from in like the late um, 19th and early 20th centuries. So yeah, definitely someone we want to learn about. And as Yara mentioned, Quinn, you wrote an excellent article, which people can find in the link below um, if you want to learn more uh, about her about her history. But of course, keep watching and we're going to talk more about it with Quinn. Um, so, you know, we've talked on this show extensively um, about the need for internationalism. You know, the International Socialist Alternative is an international organization. And even with Martin Luther King, um, we talked about it. And a few weeks back, we had a great episode on the climate, um, which, you know, young people really, truly understand the need for internationalism. Um, but Ida B. Wells, she too, in the early 1900s, um, understood this need for internationalism. And I know Yara is very much going to like this story. It has to do with um, the UK. But Quinn, can you tell our viewers the story of how Ida B. Wells um, effectively ended ly lynching for two decades in the city of Memphis? Yeah, it's, it's pretty impressive. Um, so she'd been doing all this organizing and all this journalism. Uh, against lynching, but then um, she made this trip to Britain that really like sort of qualitatively tipped the scales um, and ended lynching for a really long time. So she understood that um, the UK was a really important trade partner for um, Southern cotton. And if she could sort of um, get some like public outcry going among the British, um, and sort of weaken that trade relationship where white business owners in the South would, would fear for their profits because, you know, one of their main trade partners is turning against them, that would be really impactful. Um, and that's exactly what she did. She, she founded the first ever anti-lynching committee um, in Britain. It's called the uh, British Anti-Lynching Society. Um, and she the British press started putting out um, articles condemning um, the brutality of the South and the, um, you know, the fact that their trade partners were, were turning a blind eye, um, essentially. And so it's also, uh, I think, um, worth noting this was also during the Great Migration, so tons and tons of black people leaving the South. Um, Wells published articles supporting this, saying, you know, 
it's time for black people to, to leave with all their, their labor power, with all their buying power, uh, and get somewhere safe. And so obviously, uh, that was also making my business owners really nervous um, to lose all that, that labor and that buying power. So um, it was a sort of combination of factors that, that put the pressure necessary to get lynchings to, to stop in, in Memphis. So yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, that just shows the power of, of internationalizing social movements. And I think that was really one of the major strengths of the, the BLM rebellion last summer. Yeah, I think it's 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 incredible to hear how, you know, in every stage of fighting against oppression, we see how the the thing that the capitalists care about the most is their profit. It, they don't care about morality, they don't care about the human rights, they care about the profits, they care about the bottom line. And I think it's just incredible to see how when when activists understand this, they can make these connections to the wider movement and also employ these tactics that are really useful and can actually make change, even if, of course, the way to um, kind of take down oppression completely and racism completely is v very long and cannot be done under a system that puts profit first. But I also, like, Quinn, I think you talked a little about, a little bit about before, uh, about how kind of Martin Luther King was making these points about how this movement against racism has to be kind of collective. It can't just be of black people against white people. It has to be together. Um, I like, and, and I think that that also, obviously that was against uh, the economic inequality um, that, uh, ha that was very prevalent at the time. But I think what's important about Ida Wells, that she did very similar things about the suffragette movement that was big at the time, and kind of talking about kind of desegregating this movement that was very much segregated at the time. There was this division in the movement uh, because of how segregated society as a whole was. Um, that kind of a lot of the white suffragettes at the time kind of. It, preferred not to contend with questions about uh, voting rights for black women and wanted to first of all win uh, voting rights for white women, which obviously is a terrible position. So how did uh, Ida Wells, how was she able to organize against segregation in the suffragette movement and, and the women's movement generally? Yeah, I mean, to put it simply, she really just defied it. Um, she didn't cooperate with the segregation going on in the movement. Um, I mean, she tried to, to move Susan B. Anthony and other leading white suffragettes at the time to a better position. Um, at the time, they just weren't receptive. They were convinced that, you know, if they were to admit black women into their organizations, that they would lose the support of um, basically racist southern white uh, suffragettes. And um, yeah, they were concerned about that and really unfortunately kind of committed to segregation at the time so Wells answer to this was basically to keep organizing you know if they were going to be excluded um, they'd better form their own organizations there was a huge movement of um, clubs formed by uh, black women which you know put out their own publications fought on their own issues uh, unique to black women um, and Wells found her own club called the Al Alpha Suffrage Club with um, two of her white friends it was um, an integrated club and um, that year that it was founded, they were invited to a, um, they, or I'm not sure actually if they were invited, they attended a um, uh, suffrage march, um, and the leaders of the march requested that they walk in the back, because, you know, it was integrated, it was pr predominantly black club, is my understanding, um, and again, these leaders were, were concerned that um, white southern suffrage supporters would see these black women in the march and uh, potentially withdraw their support so their solution was basically to like try to hide the the group which is ridiculous um and wells just completely rejected it she walked um she and her her group walked with the rest of their state contingent um basically to be like look see like the the march is integrated and the sky is not falling um it's better this way we're stronger together um, and beyond that, you know, there's a natural link of solidarity where the, the same system that's restricting the political rights of white women is also restricting our political rights. Um, and we were, yeah, it's a, a natural link of solidarity that we would have. So, yeah, this is just one moment of so many where um, her courage really came in handy. She had, yeah, her strength of character is just like unimaginable. I think it's, it's so amazing to hear about this because I think it's, it would be so easy to kind of 
think about, oh, the white women don't want to uh, fight for our right of suffrage too, so we'll just do a black movement. Uh, but the, I think it's so kind of significant that the, the political approach was always, no, we're not segregating more than is already segregated. The only way that we can actually win liberation, whether it's for women or the working class or minorities, is always through solidarity between everyone who is oppressed. And I think that is such an important kind of lesson and idea to learn from. And I want to go back a little bit to uh, Martin Luther King, because I think there's something that is always talked about in relation to him, which is the trajectory that he was moving towards, because obviously we talked a little bit about how much uh, his position changed uh, throughout the years. And obviously after his assassination, there's all of these uh, discussions on where he, what, where his uh, ideology and where his kind of, well, meth where his methods are going. So I think a lot of people quote him talking about democratic socialism, saying uh, call it democracy or call it democratic socialism, but there must be a better distribution of wealth within this country uh, for all of God's children. So LGA, what do you think? Do you think that Martin Luther King was a socialist? There's a letter from uh, Dr. King to, at the time, his, his girlfriend, Coretta Scott, um, that says, basically, I'm more, to paraphrase, I'm more socialistic in my thinking than I am capitalistic uh, in my thinking. And I think that's very important from the standpoint that Dr. King did read Karl Marx. He did read uh, a lot of the, uh, the ideas of the radical labor movement, uh, some of his greatest teachers, um, uh, Dr. Benjamin uh, Mays, um, Reinhold Niebuhr, um, A. Philip Randolph, they came out of either the radical Christian uh, theology, liberation theology, or they were socialists, uh, or they were progressives. And so right from the very underpinning of King's political uh, uh, trajectory was socialistic ideas. But his ideas were, were not coming out of a Marxian understanding of history and, and, and the world. Uh, he didn't have a materialist, a dialectical materialist framework, although he understood that. It came out of the radical black church. It came out of a basic articulation of, of G, the historical Jesus and the social gospel. Um, and so his radical Christian democratic socialism is really rooted in that. While at the same time, he understood that the wheels of of world history is are really turned by ordinary working people, the poor and the oppressed. And so um, as time went on in his articulation of those ideas, when he talks about, as Quinn correctly stated, right, the Gilded Age, and particularly uh, in, in his, in his man different manifestations, uh, talking about the Vietnam War, for as an example, it allowed him, his more radical features began to show itself because at that historical moment, we needed a leadership to speak of that. And so that's the brilliance actually of Dr. King. But also he is moved by the fact that pe the people's consciousness is also evolving and developing as well. When we think of the Poor People's Campaign, Dr. King had to be taught and, 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 and basically uh, tutored on the question of the existence of the role of the black family, particularly black women, black single mothers, welfare recipients. And so the Poor People's Campaign was also an educator for him as well as this black male uh, minister who had certain level of privilege in, in the black community. And so what we understand as, uh, what we understand as King, King is evolving and what we see at the very end on April 3rd or April 4th, the day of his assassination, is that we see a king that I think this generation can learn greatly from in the sense of campaigning, organizing, but even more importantly, how he understood socialist ideas and how that could speak to a new generation that if we want to make our world anew, we must look towards those ideas and those methods of constructing a society that's based on peace, that's based on solidarity, that's based on freedom, and that's based on you and I coming together and producing a beautiful world.
I'm so glad you asked Eldria that question, Yara, because, you know, people talk about that all the time. Was Martin Luther King a socialist? And I think Algeria answered it um, beautifully. But for our last question, I want to go to Quinn. Um, you know, being in the International Socialist Alternative, we participate in many different types of struggle, you know, whether it be, you know, racism, like we're talking about today, or the climate, the labor movement. And we always talk about how um, capitalism is the problem and socialism is the solution. But that idea can be kind of daunting. Like, how can we fight this entire, you know, economic system? It's, it's hard to think of that much of, of, of systematic change. So, Quinn, speaking to other student activists like yourself, what is needed right now if we want to successfully transform our society? Whew, it's a big one. Um... I guess, I mean, I'll say I'm incredibly hopeful for my generation. I think like the support for people like AOC and Bernie is a really good indication of young people's politics these days. Um, and I think a lot of the radicalization that has gone on in the past year during the pandemic has been kind of invisible, but you know, since we're all in isolation, but it's absolutely happening um, where young people are, are just seeing the gross mishandling of the pandemic, the again, widening uh, wealth inequality with people like, um, Bezos profiteering massively during the pandemic and um, I see TikToks and stuff all the time where young people are like, wow, I never would have expected I'd become a socialist um, during the quarantine. So I think it's happening. Um, I think what's missing is a real decisive break with um, the Democratic Party. So, I mean, if I could just address young people, I would say like, you know, you don't have to listen to the people who say you need to settle for Biden. You don't need to listen to the excuses people make for, for Democratic politicians like, you know, oh, there was a Republican Senate, they couldn't have done anything. Um, you don't need to listen to, to people who say that it's, you know, somehow harm reduction to vote against your sincere political convictions. That's crazy. Um, you don't need to wait to start building the political alternative that actually represents, um, you know, the program that you want. Uh, the kind of world that you want in the future. So yeah, I think people are there. It's just, yeah, like you said, daunting to think about actually um, putting that into action. And so I would suggest, you know, to make it less daunting, join organizations. You, you, it's much easier to do with support of, of an organization. So I would tell young people to, to get out, um, join something that appeals to you. And um, yeah, just, you know, connecting that to a break with the Democratic Party, building a new party that, that doesn't have corporate cash, um, that, um, you know, where the program is democratically decided by its members. I think we should uh, make like MLK, like Algier made out and basically move from this sort of tendency to try to want to uh, reform the Democrat Democratic Party to actually realizing we need, um, you know, working class grassroots struggle. So, yeah, that would be, I think that's what we need. That would be um, the next step for young people today. Thanks, Quinn. That's really inspirational. And actually, uh, not last question, Algier, I'm curious your take on this. You know, Quinn um, is speaking to the young people, you know, specifically in the U.S., but for workers around the world, um, you know, what, what, what would you say to them if they want to participate in transforming society, if they want change? Well, what's interesting, what's taking place right now is this amazing union drive in Bessemer, uh, Alabama. And we got to remind ourselves that Dr. King, um, the last campaign he was active in uh, was the Memphis sanitation worker strike, mainly black workers, mainly black men uh, who were living under not just economic oppression, but racial oppression at the workplace. And so when I'm thinking of Dr. King, I'm thinking of Bessemer, I'm thinking of Memphis, I'm thinking about what took place last year during the rebellion. The first, the early phases of it, where it was multiracial, yes, it was black, uh, uh, youth centered, but multiracial. It was a protest against Trump. It was a protest against the pandemic. It was a protest against what they've seen for so long. And so you have a generation that's being born out of that. They're being born out of Bessemer. They're being born out of the rebellion. They're being born out of the right wing vigilante violence. They're being born out of the complicity of the Democratic Party when they say they can't do this and can't do that. Well, Dr. King always said, when a man straightens up straightens up his back, another man can't ride it. And so this generation is going to have to straighten up its back, put his head up high and say, I am of the working class. I am poor. I'm oppressed. 
But if I can get down with my people and the rest of the folks that are living the reality I'm living through, we can transform this world. And so if anything, Dr. King, SMR, and the Memphis sanitation workers are the inspiration that we should learn from to live, live in a world where there is no violence that we see. There's no environmental destruction that we see. And that, to me, is a powerful thing that this young generation uh, can, can take home and begin to organize and build from. I want to thank you both so much for coming on the show today. This has been educational, enlightening, inspirational. Um, and yeah, I want, I want to thank you. And uh, please come back and, and join us again soon. Wow, Toya, I am like, I feel like I've just been to a lecture, but in the best way possible. I've learned so much from this. It was really great. I mean, you know, Quinn's a student, Algiers a worker. The dynamic was great, but I learned so much, you know, like, some of the things that Dr. King uh, 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 said and fought for, and I'm really glad Algier clarified the, the socialist question, because I'm telling you, people talk about this all the time. And this, you know, the, the story of Ida B. Wells, I, I'm with you, Yara. I heard of her, but I didn't know about her until I read Quinn's article. And um, hearing her explain the stories, it just, it shows that there's so many fighters in history that uh, I don't want to say are forgotten. They're not forgotten, but they're not talked about enough. Yeah, definitely. I think especially in the context of, you know, activists and like figures that kind of connected all of these struggles together and not just connected them, but won actual victories. Like, I think it's so important because I, I, I like I do understand, you know, about the, that last couple of questions that we asked. I do understand that frustration that some people have with kind of socialist organizations when we go like, well, you know, we won't be able to get rid of your oppression unless we change the system. It's like, whoa, we, we know we can't, but at the same time, this is going to take a while. So I think it's really important that we talk about people who actually were able to, obviously within the confines of the system, make some progress because we can't minimize that. Like the difference between, like the, the, the differences that the, you know, the civil rights movement have made for people, uh, like for, for black people in the US, what, you, you can't minimize the effect of that. That is a very big, even though oppression doesn't end it, it's a big difference. Absolutely. We still have to fight for the issues today, even though we need to transform um, society, you know, as a whole. Exactly. And we're never going to say, well, you know, <laughs> um, just... Don't like let, let's uh, not have like let's have segregation in buses because stopping the segregation isn't going to stop racism. It's always going to be fighting for those concessions that we can win under capitalism while still understanding that the root of oppression is that system. And if we want to get rid of it completely, we have to fight that system. Absolutely, which I think is a good transition to my favorite part of the show every week. Yara, do you want to tell our viewers our our shout out this week? Yeah, I know it's it's really incredible to, to, that every week we have something to talk about in this in this kind of segment about kind of like the heroic actions of activists around the world. And I want to take this kind of uh, the segment today to talk about Myanmar because I think you know as as people watching this will know, there's been a military coup uh, or in, in the beginning of February, and since then there's been mass protests, mass demonstrations, multiple general strikes. It's actually incredible to see what's happening there. And the movement against the coup was kicked off by health workers who went on strike and gar garment workers as well. Teachers joined in soon after, you know, all women dominated industries. And it's so good because even though women, you know, women played this massive role in Myanmar, but it's not just in Myanmar. We've, we've seen women and basically at the front lines of every single mass movement around the world today which I, I feel like is not it's just it's so important to kind of mention that because i think it's easy like when we talk about oppression it's always easy to forget that women black people minorities lgbtq plus people don't only fight against their own oppression uh, as these separate groups but generally leading the movements of the working class and it's so inspiring and so incredible to see you know the role of the, of the working class as a whole has been so significant in myanmar with the strike uh being taken up as a central tactic of this movement and 
This is especially important uh, uh, in the fight against the coup because the military in Myanmar owns significant po portions of the economy there. So, you know, the, the movement was met with, as you, would, as you would guess when we talk about military coup, major extreme repression. Hundreds of people have been uh, murdered by the military, including children uh, like it's it's actually disgusting to hear about this and despite this brutal repression the people of Myanmar stood strong and are still standing strong and a shout out is obviously not enough um, for that and this is not you know the only thing that we're doing uh, you know trade union members in Myanmar send a solidarity photo to Amazon workers and then the Amazon workers in Bessemer in Alabama send photos back and the support of this struggle and, you know, the showing the international solidarity of these movements is so incredibly important. And the International Socialist Alternative obviously stands in solidarity with the fighters for democracy in Myanmar. And we support the movement and the fight for democratic rights and against oppression and repression. And also fight for a society that is organized on the basis of human need and not profit. And we've talked about this so much today and we always talk about how just absolutely important it is. So please follow our Facebook page, which is, uh, it's called Revolutionary Workers in Solidarity with the Spring Revolution. It's also gonna be linked in the description. So please go and follow and like this page, uh, especially if you are an activist in Myanmar, please contact us, get in touch with us uh, uh, if you're interested in what you've heard today and in our ideas generally, because we really wanna be able to support the movement there as much as possible. So the shout out of this week is going to everyone who's fighting for democracy in Myanmar. And also, it's not just a shout out, it's calling you to contact us and help us uh, create this uh, action of solidarity across the world. But just before you go and wait till next week, we talked about Martin Luther King just now. We talked about Ida B. Wells. And there's so many other interesting revolutionary uh, people that we could talk about. So please put in the comments anyone you think would be interesting to talk about so that maybe next week or the week after we can discuss those uh, people because there's just so many inspirational people and obviously we're not the type to go for a cult of personality we don't just think the individuals move the world but it is important to talk about the lessons and the history of those revolutionary people and learn from them as well so if you have anyone you think is worthwhile talking about please put the name in the comments so thank you so much for listening. Obviously, thank you uh, to Elgir and Quinn for being with us and being so good at concisely explaining these really big ideas. Uh, and hopefully see you uh, next time, uh, next week, same time, same place. So see you later. Bye bye. This is World to Win. Every Sunday, we broadcast with speakers from across the globe, bringing you the latest news and analysis on the fast moving global events from a socialist perspective. Subscribe to the International Socialist Alternatives YouTube page and click the bell to get notified when we go live for a new episode. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram because there's a lot to do and we have a world to win. When they fight! When they fight! When they fight! Solidarity!